thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, so <clears throat> today I'll um, describe uh, gravitational effective field theory islands and the four gra graviton amplitude. And this is work that I've done with uh, Demetrius Cosmopoulos, uh, who's in the audience, uh, just graduating, uh, and he's going, going to be at Geneva next year. And then uh, Sasha Tichibadeya. Um, so uh, the basic outline of what I'll be talking about is uh, the question of consistent UV completions for weakly coupled gravity. And uh, the way we approach this is the way uh, many people are working on it right now, which is you use the basic uh, uh, information of unitarity, causality, and crossing, and you try to find constraints on what's a consistent EFT. And the way we're going to approach this problem is uh, very pragmatic. Uh, we're going to be looking at data. Okay, not experimental data. I wish there was some, but there obviously there isn't. Uh, but looking at theoretical data to guide us in our thinking and to point out some features that we should be looking for that uh, to guide future research. Uh, and the, by, the, by data, I, I mean something very simple. Uh, you pick a, a consistent UV completion of some kind, and then you look at the coefficients. And of course, people have been doing this from string theory, using string theory data from the beginning of time. Uh, because if you get some kind of bound, you just might want to ask, where does your, uh, where do your theories lie? Do they even satisfy the bounds? Uh, it may be a way of checking your bounds. And, and just some idea of, of uh, where your, how your bounds are doing compared to the theories that we actually know. Okay, and that's not something, of course, very old. Uh, the new data that we're looking at, it's not a complete consistent UV completion, but it's, it's uh, an intermediate idea that you imagine there is a UV completion of some kind, and then uh, a little bit lower down and, and <coughs> lower energy, uh, we have uh, a description in terms of uh, minimally coupled matter. And that description we know is perfectly good. It's completely unitary, it satisfies crossing. It'll satisfy every condition that we want to put on it. And therefore, we can use that uh, one loop data, the, the EFT that we extract from a one loop, uh, from one loop amplitudes, we can use that as data to guide the very low energy EFT and to, to guide the constraints that we get from that. Uh, and the way we do get this data is uh, we, we just throw all the modern techniques at it. Uh, just uh, uh, it's kind of fun to actually uh, do something like this. And so he computed a four graviton amplitude uh, with massive loops. Uh, and uh, for reasons that are a little bit unclear to me, this hadn't been done before. And then we used this information uh, to uh, provide low energy EFT data and insight. And the first thing that hits you in the face, you don't have to look very hard. It just, you see it immediately is the data lives on tiny islands. And immediately uh, you say, you think, well, gee, that's very strange because string theory and whatever model we just had, this intermediate model, they're completely different. How did they land on very tiny islands? So immediately you expect there should be tight constraints on the Wilson coefficients, on the, co the EFT coefficients uh, and, and, and that you can use that to then guide further research. Uh, and, and I'll talk about interpreting the islands, uh, and then um, I'll finish off with just a few, a few things on uh, getting some two-sided bounds, accounting for helicity. You can get to some interesting bounds uh, when you take into account the helicity structure of the graviton amplitudes, and then uh, an interesting bound on the R cubed coefficient, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some questions for the future. So what's the problem? Well, it's very simple. Um, and uh, th this, this dates back, uh, there's the Adams, Arkani Hamid, Duboski uh, et al. paper, uh, 2006, and it's a very uh, simple question. Here's a EFT for gravity. Um, so you can see that there's Einstein and then there's corrections. This this uh, this uh, 
a remont. This is a remont to the fourth term minus r cubed. And there's some coefficients here, say betas. Okay, and the question is what what values are allowed? And the constraints we have are the normal constraints of quantum field theory. Uh, and we try to answer that question. Uh, and, and this is something that now a lot of people have been working on this, this basic question. And I think more people are, are uh, joining uh, uh, to look at this, uh, look at this question, uh, not just for gravity, but of course, for any EFT, you can ask exactly these same types of questions. And the way we approach this problem is with amplitudes. And we like amplitudes for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, the if you work with a S matrix element, it's you avoid issues with field redefinitions and gauge fixing. So you're working with a quantity that's invariant that everyone will agree it's the same quantity. Uh, the, the other reason is, is just the techniques that we're talking about, where we want to use unitarity, we want to use crossing, dispersion relations. Those are the tools that we use to put bounds on these coefficients. And that those tools are part of scattering amplitudes, are very natural in scattering amplitudes. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, other ideas which immediately put the con where we get our constraints from. It's positivity of partial wave coefficients. And this has been known uh, forever that, that the, uh, when you do a partial wave expansion, you should get positive coefficients. Okay, uh, and then uh, of course we have our amplitude methods, which we can use to uh, get you know fairly complicated, uh, fairly complicated calculations. We we know the methods of just working through it. Okay. Uh, so that's what the problem is. Okay, and uh, let me get to the punchline, so you you know where I'm going. Um, so from those different ideas of uh, the unitarity, the crossing, uh, then we get, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, positivity, then we get some kind of constraints. So this would be a typical constraint. The red region would be a typical constraint. And I'll say a little bit about where that comes from. Uh, but, but you get some region of, of the parameter space. These are essentially Wilson coefficients, ratios of Wilson coefficients. Okay, they're not exactly Wilson coefficients there coefficients and amplitudes, but morally speaking, they're just like Wilson coefficients. And we have some reasonably large region that the constraints put on. So the, the constraints are not uh, brilliant yet. Uh, the name of the game is to try to make them truly brilliant. And then we look at the data. What, when we actually analyze theories that we think are, in fact, ones that are physically sensible, where do they wind up? This very tiny place. It's almost a line. It's, it's actually not perfectly aligned. We'll, we'll I'll have a closer look at that, but it's almost a line. Everything falls right here. Okay, and so that's that's in a sense the challenge. Uh, what this talk is about is, you could say the challenge is the data seems to indicate that we're lying on a very very tiny region. Physically sensible theories live in a very tiny place, but. Uh, but the constraints that we get, they're, they're still not right on top of where we see the island. And, and, and to try to understand exactly what the constraints are, to try to get it as tight as possible. Okay. Now, I, of course, the, the data I'm talking about, it doesn't prove anything. It, it just points us in a direction. It just tells us this is what we need to be looking at. This is what we need to be focusing on. So there's the questions, how much room is there for improving the bounds? And where do the physical theories actually lie? And uh, as I explained, we're, we're looking, we're going to be looking at data, string theory data, that's well known. And then uh, this new data, the one loop data, okay? And uh, just to explain the basic setup of how we think about this one loop data is um, we, start with gravity minim minimally coupled to matter up to spin two. There's a reason why we use spin two because we know that if we're at spin two matter, so around here the matter, 
going around the loop is is uh, is spin two. Uh, we know that um, we, uh, we know that that's going to be consistent. Okay, and then what you do is you go you go uh, to the low energy EFT. So now you're collecting a set of contact interactions, Wilson coefficients, and we want to study study this. And for anything involving the massless states, the gravitons, we just leave that alone. We don't do anything to that. So it's just an EFT of low energy particles like, like the graviton. Okay. Um, and a few comments. One thing we're not going to do here um, is we are not going to be talking about relations of the EFT coefficients to Newton's constants. There's been some interesting papers recently about that. Uh, 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 that, that that's not the, the way uh, we uh, set things up uh, to include that. Okay. Um, and um, the 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 the, uh, the uh, basic idea is we take, uh, as I said, the masses. We take them uh, to be large. Okay. We want to do this calculation of some matter circulating in the loop and. The first thing we think is, oh, it must be in the literature somewhere. Uh, one loop calculations are completely doable, uh, one way or the other. You know, you think someone would have done it, but in in fact, it was not available in the literature. So then we said, okay, well, I guess we have to go off and compute this if we want this data. And we we throw all the modern tools: unitarity method, double copy, supersymmetric decomposition, integration by parts. Dimension shifting is a whole machinery uh, of doing these types of calculations in, in a nice way. So the first thing I'll do is describe a little bit about how we did it. I, I'm not going to go into too many details, but maybe just give, give you a flavor of where this data came from. So we use a basic tool, generalized unitarity. Uh, so we don't do Feynman diagrams. We don't like Feynman diagrams for gravity theories. Uh, certainly not. Uh, uh, so instead, what we do is we work in a completely on-shell way. We build the uh, loop amplitudes from using tree amplitudes. And then we use uh, to build tree amplitudes. We have uh, other techniques for that. Uh, and and the, the basic idea is that there's a, a um, methodology, which was actually developed for doing QCD collider physics for doing loop amplitudes systematically. It's, it's, it, you could think of it as something like Feynman rules, a, a set of rules that you have to follow on how to assemble the loop amplitudes from the tree amplitudes. And, and there's some interesting cute concepts uh, which uh, um, didn't actually really need, but uh, this idea of generalized unitarity where you start cutting legs, putting legs on shell in uh, in co more, much more intricate ways than just a two particle cut or three particle cut. Uh, and, and that can be very helpful um, in many cases. So here's the calculation, uh, how it's set up is um, we use, uh, we use, uh, uh, we look at, let's say one loop, looking at the two particle cuts is all we need to do. So there's three channels, you look at these, two particle cuts, you then construct an integrand by simply multiplying tree amplitudes, carrying out the loop integral as if though the legs are off shell, uh, just using standard integration technology. And then uh, that gives you uh, all the contributions that have an S channel cut in them. Okay, and then you can do this for the three channels and you assemble it. And, uh, and in that way, you get an answer. The answer is now set of coefficients and times what are called master integrals. So they're the simplest set of integrals, they're scalar integrals. Uh, and these are known integrals that you can look up in the QCD literature. And most of that is obtained that way. And then there's a technical problem having to do with the fact that this masses, these are massive amplitudes, where you get integrals that have no cuts in them and they're part of the answer. And you have to uh, figure out how to get them. And uh, the basic idea is to use ultraviolet properties. Also, decoupling, demand decoupling. You can get you can get constraints on these coefficients. So that way, you can determine the entire amplitude. Okay. 
Um, maybe one one thing that's uh, that we use that's very nice uh, is double copy. Uh, there's tree amplitudes in here. So instead of doing gravity, we don't like doing gravity. We like doing gauge theory. So we replace the gravity calculation with essentially a gauge theory calculation, and then uh, and then have a rule for transferring the gauge theory answer to the gravity answer. Uh, and, and this is an idea that started in uh, in uh, string theory, Kawhi Wong and Tai, uh, and it it tells us uh, but. Uh, through some uh, nice way how to do a conversion from a gauge theory answer. Uh, basically what it says is that uh, if you can align the kinematic numerators so that they satisfy the same Jacobi identities as uh, color factors, you pick a diagram, there's a numerator, a kinematic numerator, and uh, if you can align the Jacobi identities, then um, then, uh, the, uh, then what happens is to go from a gauge theory answer to a gravity answer, you just take color and re you replace it with, with uh, a um, numerator factor, as simple as that. Okay, and, and there, there's some, uh, there, there's some uh, issues about controlling the states with physical state projectors, but, but uh, at least in, in the case we were looking at here, that's really not a, uh, much of a problem. Okay, so um, so then uh, uh, you go ahead and do this calculation. I should add uh, because this case we're looking at is so simple, where there's just a, a mass in the loop. We're looking at a massive particle, let's say a massive uh, a spin two particle in the loop. Then um, uh, uh, the that answer flows out of the massless one simply by dimensional reduction. There, there's um, essentially you can convert massless answers to massive answers using dimensional reduction, just going to a higher dimension than dimensionally reducing. And, and you can pick up, uh, let's say, massive particles in the loop as easily as massless. OK, uh, Okay. let's just give the answer. You get an answer. OK, it looks a little messy. It's in terms of a set of integrals. Uh, 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 so the, let's see, the different spin particles in the loop, uh, the, 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 um, the, you, you get a set of answers, that, let's say scalar in the loop. This is what it looks like. It's in terms of a set of integrals. We've done some dimension shifting. There's like 10, D equals 10 minus two epsilon. That's an integral in 10 dimensions. Why do we do that? It's because it makes the answer look nicer. It's <laughs> just a technical trick to get more compact looking answers. It's a bit of a mess, but okay, it's, it's a one loop gravity calculation. Uh, and and um, all the contributions, they look similar. I mean, you just have to crank through one after the other. And uh, for the different helicity configurations of the gravitons, uh, we, we've gone through all the different possibilities. Uh, and uh, the, the, um, these integrals that you, you see here, they're known from QCD, okay? And there's also a reason why we're doing this full-blown calculation, because you'll see there's an assumption that's needed in order to get the constraints uh, having to do with good behavior at high energy. In the Reggie limit, you need a, a good behavior. And the way we know that this object we're looking at has good behavior is because we calculated it. So we know everything about it. Uh, and that'll be very important so that we know exactly what constraints, when exactly they're valid in, in the context of this model. Okay. So maybe that's uh, uh, quite a bit of extra work to get the full expression instead of getting, let's say, a power series in one over M. Uh, but still, we need to know that information on how this thing behaves. And just a little comment, all the integrals are known. Here's just a little sample. It's just standard standard integrals, uh, polylogs and logarithms. Um, okay. And uh, okay, now, you, now that you heard this, you say, okay, these guys do calculations in strange ways. Uh, how do you know it's right? right? That's an obviously important question. Uh, and of course we do a calculation, we'd like to be right. And the answer is of course we do, consistency checks 
And there's a long list of them. Uh, and so first thing would be infrared singularities. You make sure amplitude has no infrared singularities as m goes to zero, except for spin two. And that's because gravity does not have collinear singularities. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, the, uh, all the particles except for the graviton, if you take m goes to zero, there should be no infrared singularity from a particle in the loop. And indeed, that's what happens. Uh, that is, of course, non-trivial. Another, uh, another is uh, if you align things carefully, then you can, by taking m goes to zero, you can reproduce directly uh, the massless result in terms of formal integrals. And then you know that, that you've done the calculation correctly or it's strong check. Uh, decoupling has to be true. Decoupling is non-trivial. If you, the, the expressions uh, term by term don't have decoupling, you add everything up uh, for m goes to infinity, the the uh, the uh, if you literally take m goes to infinity, the answer is zero as it should be, uh, so that's good. Uh, and and here is one that's actually very useful and directly relevant: is uh, if you get an, some data, you can compare it against EFT bounds uh, in the literature, or you derive your own. Uh, and and in that way, you could, you know, if it's inside the bound, then life is good. If it's outside the bound, it means one of two things. Either you have an error or the bounds are wrong. And in, indeed, that's how we caught some mistakes with bounds because uh, we discover our data lies outside the bounds. So it's also very important for checking bounds. You want to use data. You come up with a new bound of some kind. You say, I think this is the bound. Then you want to use the data to check the bounds. So it goes both ways. Um, and, and there's various other, other things. Uh, one thing was sensible Reggie limits. Um, I'll show you what they are. OK, and this consistency means that we can rely on the data. So we're going to derive some data. How do we get some data? It's very simple now. What you do is you take the amplitude that you've done this hard way, and you just series expand in 1 over m. Um, and you do it for all the different particles and collect, you collect some coefficients, you collect coefficients and amplitudes. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's that, um, it, it's, it's that simple. Uh, once you have this data, once you have the amplitude, uh, and uh, I should mention, uh, not only are we looking at theories with, let's say, these individual particles circulating in the loop, but of course, any linear combination make up your own theory of what you want circulating in the loop. And that's also valid data, OK? Um, and, and this was one of the helicity configurations, some of the data. But uh, you, you do this for all the possibilities. OK, another source of data, and this is well known. You can get this from the textbooks, uh, Green, Schwartz, and Witten, is uh, you look at, at um, the uh, uh, string theory, um, and we're looking, uh, I, I, this is pretty important, maybe I, I didn't mention, we're looking at weakly coupled gravity, right? So that's the assumption of what one uh, basic assumption, weakly coupled gravity. The matter itself can do whatever it likes. So anything on the inside can do what it's like, but gravity itself is weakly coupled. That's why we're looking at tree level. Uh, so we're looking at tree level and you say, okay, why are you only looking at tree level? But it's weakly coupled gravity. Just the leading order is what we're doing here. We use super, super string theory, heterotic string, bosonic string. Okay, maybe you'll say bosonic string. Wait a second, isn't that inconsistent? It has the tachyon. Uh, yeah, okay. If you don't like that data, every time I show you something, uh, just cross out the bosonic string. Uh, it's not going to matter. The bosonic string will live merrily on the island with uh, the other string theories. Um, but you can cross it out if you don't like it. Uh, and then this, these amplitudes in string theory, they satisfy very good Reggie behavior. T goes to infinity. Uh, then uh, there's a, well, there's a prefactor that goes like T to the fourth. The amplitude itself is bounded by T squared. Okay, and, and, and that's the usual assumed bound that a good theory is supposed, supposed to have. Okay, so what do we do now? Um, we start with uh, uh, the amplitudes of gravity, 
four graviton amplitude. We write it in this form. There's a, some spinner prefactor. This is just some prefactor having to do with with helicity. Uh, in this in this case, it's really just like t to the fourth, uh, the, the Mandelstam invariant, uh, times uh, some functions f, g, and h, and, and those are the ones that we'll be talking about. Uh, it, it's a little more convenient to talk about these f's rather than the amplitudes because you pull out this overall factor and the way we work is we make standard assumptions. So uh, I'm not going to defend the assumptions here. This is a standard. I can view it as let's assume that this is true. Reggie behavior crossing, crossing has to hold parity, unitarity, and analyticity have to hold. Uh, now, these assumptions, let me just uh, point out, these assumptions are not quite as obvious as you might think. For example, crossing. You might say, well, of course, amplitudes have crossing. We, learned, we all learned that uh, long ago, uh, but it's it's not as obvious as you might think. It's it's a the, the question is a little more subtle, but uh, we ignore all that and we just make believe crossing has to hold with no no subtleties. Just proceed. And for example, the Reggie behavior, you can have arguments about whether this bound actually holds. Um, uh, first, uh, why, it, why it has to hold. We know it holds for string theory, but it doesn't have to hold in general. Uh, never mind, we just assume it to be true. Standard assumption. Okay. Um, and of course, unitary name analyticity, uh, uh, that we better be assuming is, is correct. Okay. Uh, so, what do we have? Well, there's our amplitude, there's our, our effective field theory. Um, and here's our amplitudes. And we don't work with the effective field theory Lagrangian. Generally, uh, we're not interested in the Lagrangian, but there's some mapping of the Lagrangian coefficients to the amplitude coefficient. So here's F. You just series expand in one over M, uh, and you get a set of, of uh, coefficients. The ones we're mostly going to be interested in are the local ones the art of the fourth type and der derivatives of art of the fourth. We'll be mainly studying this. Um, and we can draw little diagrams uh, showing what kind of the, the types of um, contributions. Uh, let's say the first term here, that's just tree level graviton exchange. Uh, then we can have, let's say, an R cubed. You can include a scalar if you like. Uh, and, then, and then there's, uh, all the higher derivative contributions to this amplitude. Okay, and mainly we're going to be looking at these coefficients. So when you see a plot, I'll show you some plots. It's these coefficients that we're going to be talking about. Okay, and we do this uh, looking at all helicities uh, to try to understand uh, something about the helicity structure. We have the information, we can use it. Um, I mean, we've calculated, we've, we have um, theories and information on these different helicities. So, so we, we can test constraints, build some constraints from unitarity, and then uh, we, we, can, we compare to the, um, to, the, uh, uh, to the data against our constraints. Uh, and, and you can do some cleaning up uh, of this matrix, so this is the matrix of all possible helicities by going to a special frame where things clean up and uh, you can rewrite everything in terms of just Mandelstam invariants. Okay, and then uh, the way this thing works is uh, we look at a partial wave expansion. For example, if we look at this corner, uh, you, can, you can write down uh, a sum, there'll be a sum um, of in terms of spectral density times it's Legendre polynomials, glorified Legendre polynomials. Actually, in this particular case, it is the actual Legendre polynomials. But more generally, depending on the helicity structure, you get a generalization, Wigner D functions. Okay, and Mathematica knows what these are, so that's, that's pretty happy. And the spectral density, the constraint, is the discontinuity uh, on, on, on the amplitude be written in terms of this partial wave expansion with, with spectral density. And if it's one of the guys on the 
a diagonal, you get a uh, positivity constraint. Uh, it, you can interpret this in terms of a sum over diagrams uh, with, with an exchange of a particle, a spin, a spin J, and then you can notice if the helicity structure is just right, that in fact, it's just a, a positive, the, the residue is positive, so that's good. Okay, so and now you can become much more sophisticated for the entire matrix as a much more complicated structure, but the basic idea is the same as, as just looking at, at one of the, one of the corners. Uh, you write you rewrite these discontinuities in terms of partial wave expansions using these Wigner D functions. Uh, so this would be Legendre, and here's the more complicated ones. And the, the reason why these are more complicated has to do with the helicity structure. Okay, the helicity structure of the external states. And then you start thinking, okay, what kind of constraints can I put on it? Diagonal ones is straightforward, it's positivity. Off diagonal ones are more complicated, and they're uh, the Cauchy Schwartz inequalities is what you get. Uh, but the basic idea is that the the yeah, unitarity, uh, you get a positivity constraints uh, 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 or, or uh, inequalities like that. And the, uh, the point is that we use this positivity, this is the source of constraints that will then flow when we say, okay, we bounded the region, the EFT region, it comes from this positivity. Uh, and um, the one of the key tools are dispersion relations, uh, and the way it works is real, is pretty simple. Once you've made your assumption of good Reggie behavior, that means you're making an assumption on how that these amplitudes are behaving off at infinity. Okay, uh, and once you have that, then you can close contours or open up contours. Say I have a contour integral around some residues. So that, okay, I pick up some residues, which would tell me something about the low energy theory. And then I open up the contour and, and I drop what happens at infinity. And the reason why I drop at infinity is the assumption. Then I can make a relationship between low energy and high energy. So this contour around here, that's high energy. This contour around here, that's low energy. That's looking at the EFT. We can write, uh, a simple formula, okay, uh, which um, which uh, tells us um, a relationship, a direct relationship between low energy, and this will be low energy EFT coefficients. You pick up some residues, which give you some coefficients, and then a high energy uh, integral, a high energy uh, integral along that branch cut. Uh, now, right here is the spot where I said, oh, it's good to know exactly what this amplitude, the full blown amplitude, is because we need this bound. And you may notice T cubed, it violates the assumption, right? I said, we're assuming that amplitudes, good UV completions, good Reggie behavior, and they should only go like T square. Here it goes like T cubed. So you say, okay, well, this is worse, but it's really not a big deal at all. Uh, because as long as it's a polynomial bound, all it says, as my bound gets worse, let's say for my one loop amplitudes, uh, well, they're not a full theory, they're just a, say a piece of a theory and it violated what I thought might have been my good bound. Uh, so I get a T cubed. All it says is when I do my contours, sometimes I can't drop the contribution at infinity. Very simple, close my eyes, don't look at it. I've lost uh, this, uh, the contour integral with a k equals one, I've lost it, I can't use it. So I close my eyes and I ignore it. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in in, in uh, all the higher k's, right? I do get uh, the ability to close the contour because the Reggie behavior is good enough. As long as I have polynomial behavior, I'm good to go. The worst that happens is maybe I, we lose some of the um, constraints that we might've had otherwise, but never mind. proceed ahead. Uh, and, and this loss, the fact that I violate the expected Reggie bound, it's truly no big deal. Uh, uh, that one loop amplitude is a piece of a full theory. It's really not a full UV complete theory. So you shouldn't be surprised that it might violate what you 
thought was the bound. So you get another one and you're good to go. And the key information is certain, uh, certain bounds we get, we just shouldn't look at because they're actually not valid because you couldn't close the contour. Simple as that, okay. Uh, so let's let's have a look at um, uh, you know some of the examples. So uh, this this would be uh, uh, we're we're trying to to do that opening of the contour integral uh, on one of the helicity amplitudes. F was uh, corresponded to one of the helicity amplitudes, and you get contributions. Uh, there's two channels. You get a contour integral here and here. There's two channels you have to consider. And the two channels are a little bit different and that has to do with the helicity structure. Uh, one of them, you get ordinary Legendres, the other one you get more complicated Wigner Ds. Uh, there's a different spectral functions uh, that you get. Um, and um, uh, 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 so, so th this thing now is, is a, a representation of this amplitude. Uh, there'll be a representation of the amplitude uh, that, that we can then uh, uh, make use of. And then what you do is you expand it small s and t, and you get, this is what we're after, the relationship between the EFT coefficients uh, and a dispersion relation, okay? And by the way, um, the word positivity uh, doesn't mean everything in sight is positive. In fact, it turns out that you have to be very careful with signs because, okay, you do a series expansion, it depends exactly what the functions are. And, and it turns out that, uh, that there are some signs you have to just keep an eye out on. Uh, and, but it, in a sense, it's not a big deal. If you get some minus signs, it means that uh, certain bounds that you, maybe naively you thought you could pick up, you can't pick up. Uh, and these signs just come from expanding the Wigner Ds. So now we have a math problem. We can think of this now as a math problem. And uh, the, the problem we're after is um, we have, we have uh, let's say some vector, uh, maybe this vector we can think of some, co some list of coefficients of, uh, in the EFT. And then it's written in terms of another set of vectors, which we'll call the partial waves. And then it has some um, coefficients and we know a constraint on the coefficients. Spectral densities are positive. Think of these Cs as spectral densities. And now we have a math problem. The math problem is, okay, now that I know that it can be represented in this way in terms of some partial waves with positive coefficients, what does that imply about uh, the, these uh, original coefficients, these, these amplitude coefficients? That's the math problem. Uh, and this was explained very nicely, the Arkani Hamid Wang and Wang paper. And they had a very nice description in terms of polytopes, uh, and, and um, uh, which I won't explain exactly uh, how that works. So we, I'll just uh, comment on a more lowbrow way of thinking about this, at least in easy cases, you can do that, is if you have a little math problem like this, okay, on the left-hand side, what we do is uh, we take the amplitude and we write it as these EFT coefficients, okay? Uh, which are just defined in terms of the Mandelstam invariance, the coefficient of appropriate Mandelstam invariance. Okay, on the right-hand side, we have Legendre polynomials, essentially Legendre or, or, or more generally these Wigner Ds, but a set of known functions. We have some constraints. So you ask Mathematica to go solve for what the, this region is, okay? And, and that way you can find uh, bounds on the allowed regions of, uh, usually it's done in terms of these ratios. The ratios are good. Uh, the ratios of these amplitude coefficients, okay? And it's just done by demanding. The key demand is that whatever these, positive coefficients are, they remain positive, okay? Uh, and, and in that way, we can fill out these regions, uh, like, like let's say this green region, uh, and the red region we get uh, using some crossing. Now there's a, a concept that we'll talk about is gonna play an important role in the talk, uh, which is going to be uh, low spin dominance. 
oh, I see, I, I better move along. Uh, so that, so our Connie, Hamid, Wang, and Wang, they noticed that by looking at some functions, that you get what's called low spin dominance and the partial wave expansion. It's the first ones that are the most important. Now, in, in this case, you can see the one they looked at here, you can see that there's this low spin dominance, but it, it's not, it, it's not uh, overwhelming. Uh, when we look at the data, I'll show you some data that in fact, it will be overwhelming for us. Okay, um, so what we did uh, to understand this low spin dominance is we rewrote the bounds compared to the, the way that Arkani, uh, Muhammad Wang and Wang had done it. And we did it uh, in a way that was designed by some kind of sneaky trickery so that we can study this low spin dominance, that we only wanna look at the very lowest uh, um, uh, uh, spectral densities. And if you pick exactly the right bound, exactly the right object to look at, uh, that's based on what's called the null conditions. Null condition means crossing symmetry, using crossing symmetry. You design exactly the right thing. Uh, you can get that all the spectral densities that are uh, higher, higher spin, that they all come with the same sign, and therefore you can put a bound on. That's where this comes from. And then we define a concept of low spin dominance. We say uh, if, if the um, uh, uh, the let's say like right here, the lowest guy, we want it to be bigger by a factor of alpha than all the other ones, all the other uh, contributions. Uh, and uh, and we, we want this in both channels and we call, let's say an alpha factor. Okay, and this alpha factor in the data is going to be uh, generally about a hundred. That's what the data tells us. Um, so what we do is we uh, just impose, let's call it weak, low spin dominance where we take this alpha parameter to be one. And immediately if you do that and you look at our bounds, the bounds we got, then in fact, we get tighter bounds. You can see the six bounded by six, you go to three. Uh, and, and this by the way is very normal, depending exactly what assumptions you make, you can get different bounds and exactly how clever you are in finding bounds, right? These are bounds. so someone more clever can always come up with a better bound. There's, there's, it depends exactly on how you do things. Okay, and, and I should say whatever we did, it's not optimized. We, we did not search for the optimal bounds. It was more to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, and, and I should say that there's, there's no pre proof of the, this, uh, th this concept of low spin dominance. We don't have a proof, though there's some progress. Um, now for the high partial waves, it's not hard to argue that we expect the, the spectral densities to fall exponentially. That, that's not so hard to argue. Otherwise, you're going to violate the Reggie bound. Uh, the, the more mysterious thing is what's happening for the low spins, the low, the, the low partial waves. Let me just uh, show you a little picture here of bounds. There is the data. We're plotting the data from all the theories. Pick your favorite theory. Like I say, don't like the bosonic string. Get rid of it, it makes no difference. It's all in the same place. And this y-axis means nothing, it's just to separate the points. So uh, this was the original bound that, from the Arkani Hamid paper. You can uh, do the weak. Uh, we get a, a rigorous bound by assuming weak low spin dominance. Uh, a, a, and, and the strong, there's the strong version. Strong just means this alpha parameter is 100. Uh, weak just means uh, it, it, it's, it's just an alpha parameter of one. Uh, and, and you can see that you can then begin to understand this physical region in terms of this low spin dominance. Okay. Um, and maybe here's uh, again, uh, data. This is now at the next mass level. These the four means you're moving up uh, level by level in terms of powers of uh, the, the Mandelstam advance, the dimension of the operators. What we're dealing with here. Okay, uh, this guy is a D8R to the fourth, if you're interested. And uh, there's this, this thing that uh, the data is in a tiny place, can we understand it? And the strong low spin dominance, if we take that as an assumption, then uh, the data is now lies perfectly in this strong low spin dominance region. But notice still the data is extremely tight, it's remarkable. 
how all these theories fall in this tiny region. This is not a line here. This has a little width to it, but it's almost a line. The data, all the data is lying on this line, and we understand it now in terms of this concept of the low spin dominance. Um, and, uh, and we can explain some features of the low spin dominance. Uh, just let's assume low spin dominance is perfect. So we'll just keep the first term in the, in, in the uh, partial wave expansion. So this is the lowest term. And what you notice is if you look at these coefficients, you find that it's the same, it's the same, and then divide, divide them six to four. There's a six to four ratio. And, and that's, that's in fact that slope of the line, okay? And, and in, that, in this way, we can understand by assuming this low spin dominance, we can understand the structure. Uh, but it shouldn't be too fast. Uh, see, the assumption is actually not true if you look at our data. Uh, in fact, it's not true. It's the worst for these two. Scalar in the loop, that's one of our models. Fermion in the loop. Uh, 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 it's actually not true that you can neglect the higher spin. Uh, the higher spins are substantial. But what's going on here? Something very sneaky. There's a conspiracy. The conspiracy is that as the low spin dominance fails, that you have to include higher spins to get an accurate description of this coefficient, and we know that this from our data, then what happens is the A40, it's, uh, it dominates. It's this term becomes very large uh, and it squashes the point down to, to zero. It pushes you right down to here right down the corner. So even though this thing wants to be off the line, it's back on the line because you're squashed to the origin. So that's very sneaky. So there's a little warning here. You can, you can say low spin dominance, uh, but uh, it's much more subtle than just saying those words, okay? Um, but certainly the features we understand through the, 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 the there's a, a low spin dominance clearly is playing a, a role in our understanding here. Oh, and here's some more data. Uh, you could say, okay, what happens if you move up to the D10 R to the four? What's going on? This would be the uh, type of bounds that you get by, by following the Arkani Ahmed et al. paper. Uh, and then um, if you look at where the data is, this is a tiny, tiny region. Okay, this is blown up. Okay, here the gray region is, if you say the strong low spin dominance. Once again, it's absolutely remarkable how the data lives on this line. And these theories, I, I don't know what a, a, a vector in a loop or a massive vector in a loop has to do with, with a heterotic string, but, but they clearly belong together in the low energy effective field theory. That's what we're finding here on the data. I think that's quite striking. And it, it tells us that we need to work harder on understanding what the bounds are. Okay, uh, the low spin dominance, let me just show you an example um, uh, of, of, of how, how this works. In one of the channels, uh, in, you can, you can uh, look, so this is drawn continuously, but it's only zero, two, four, six. Uh, and you can see, this is just an example of a low spin dominance that the next one in the spectral density has fallen a factor of 100. Uh, the, um, if you look, uh, let's say, um, at the super string, okay, then it doesn't fall quite as much, but it, it's in the same, same, uh, same idea that you find that the data supports the, the support of this idea of the low spin dominance. Okay. Uh, ah, so uh, since our paper, there have been improvements. Yeah, sorry, I see I'm running out of time, so I have to move along. Uh, there's uh, this very, very nice paper, this Coron uh, Hewitt and collaborators. Uh, and what they did is they used uh, better crossing information, uh, uh, you improved bound using higher K, higher K. By K, I meant the dimension of the operator. So the way we did it is we follow uh, uh, the, uh, the Arkani Hamid way where you're just looking at one mass level at a time. It's just simpler to do that. 
Uh, and also uh, you get some nice uh, geometric picture from that. So you look one mass level at a time. You don't use the full blown information by inspecting all the levels and all the constraints that you get uh, from that. So they can improve the bound and that definitely looks better. Uh, it, it's now a uh, rigorous constraint without an additional assumption of low spin dominance. Uh, and it's, it's similar to the constraint that you get by assuming strong low spin dominance. So that's definitely a heading in the right direction. But again, the question is how tightly can you squeeze it? Th this one looks pretty good. Uh, here, here's another one, another recent paper. Uh, again, I, it, there's additional crossing information that's being used. It's information that we couldn't use because if we tried using it, working at one mass level or one dimension at a time of the operators, uh, that information, there were minus signs caught in and we couldn't get new information, but by looking uh, at, uh, at the different levels and also a more sophisticated programming, we're just using Mathematica, semi-definite programming, you can get tighter constraints. So the blue region, that's the same as our red region, that's identical, uh, but then they can do better and you can see, okay, that, that's pretty nice. It's gone down a, a quite a bit, but once again, the data is still very tiny compared to the region. So there's an improvement and presumably there are more improvements that can be done if you just think more carefully about uh, all possible constraints. Okay. Um, oh, and there was ah, something very interesting in their paper. They make a comment, uh, they make an observation. Uh, if you're off, they notice that uh, if you're near the boundary that, that it can be, understood in terms of what are called accumulation points. I'll explain a little more about that in just a minute. Uh, that's basically you get an infinite number of, of uh, states piling into a single mass, and that would you could wind up far away. Um, but of course, there's a question, okay, this seems a little strange. Is it valid? Can they be ruled out? Uh, and of course, the challenge is still to find the actual island of physical validity. Now, in, in our paper, we actually did uh, write something about this about these um, accumulation point models. Um, so, okay, maybe, uh, maybe accumulation points uh, will be interesting. And so in our appendix, uh, you'll find this model. This thing is specially constructed to violate the LSD. This was done on purpose. Let's violate the, the low spin dominance uh, assumption. And let's just see what's, let's just see what's, what's, uh, What's going on? Okay. Um, and this model, it, it, it's similar to uh, to uh, what was done uh, by, by these people for scalars, uh, and it, it's designed to violate what we think is the assumption. So you give it a try, see what happens. Okay. And uh, the, the way this thing works is, if you do the partial wave expansion, you find an infinite number of spins. Uh, at one mass level. It's basically from series expanding this and rewriting it in terms of Legendre's, uh, you, you find a, a pileup of states all at the same mass. Okay, and indeed this thing violates strongly the low spin dominance. If you look in one of the channels uh, uh, and you analyze what's the dominant contribution, it's not J equals zero. It's, it, uh, <coughs> it's way off of that especially as the mass goes up. And, and we you can write closed form formulas and you know exactly what's going on. Great, you violate low spin, low spin dominance, let's see what happens. Well, it turns out that there's two channels that you have to look at, contributions, and it just happens to be that in the other channel that you look at, the low spin dominance is okay. And then there's some kind of a conspiracy that even though uh, the higher spins are dominating in this channel, it doesn't matter because the other channel squashes it. So you're back on the island. So our first attempt to find a concrete example of the accumulation points, okay, low spin dominance assumption is violated, never mind, you're still on the island. So that's pretty cute. Okay, we don't we don't have a co complete understanding of what's going on with the accumulation points, but I, I'd say this is kind of an amusing point point that it appears to be that the that the island uh, is more robust than the idea of low spin dominance. Oh, here's something quick. Uh, 
a hierarchy from islands. Let's suppose that you're just an EFT guy and you're trying to uh, uh, study uh, your EFT and you discover some funny relation between coefficients of the EFT. You see, oh, this combination is much, much less than this EFT, th this EFT coefficient. So you say, ah, oh, there must be a symmetry because how else did it become so small? And the answer is it has nothing to do with symmetry. This relation has to do with the fact we're on this island. Okay, so that would be hierarchy. You get a hierarchy and it has nothing to do with symmetry. Okay, and there's uh, other things that are in a paper, which I'll just briefly uh, gloss over because I'm definitely out of time, is uh, you can get, you can get uh, bounds between different operators, like the R cubed and the R to the fourth. This is between different levels. Uh, and what you do is you design very carefully a dispersion relation. You construct something so you get just positivity. You get the right, you know, coefficients come out to be positive just so that you can get useful constraints. And this is a constraint we derived in our paper. Okay, and, and there's a uh, notice our constraint, it doesn't know about Newton's constant. And that has to do with the annoying uh, pole. And there's an annoyance with that. Uh, there's a new paper where, in fact, they do talk about constraints in terms of Newton's constant. Uh, inelastic scattering, so that's looking at different helicities. You can write down constraints, again, by clever design. You have to be a little clever about this. It's not completely straightforward to design something where you can really get a positivity condition and extract useful information. Uh, so this would be one of them. These H's and these F's are different helicities. Uh, so you can get bounds on like all plus scattering coefficients or, or bounds on, let's say, the negative and that with a single minus. And, and that's in terms of the bound is in terms of coefficients from other amplitudes. And that happens because you're mixing the, these matrices, mix up all the, the uh, different helicities. Okay, uh, I'm almost done. Outlook. Uh, the message from the talk is new. Uh, non-trivial EFT data, we get it from looking at the one loop minimally coupled matter. And what it does is it suggests that the EFT islands are very tiny, the valid ones, physically valid ones. Um, there's, uh, <clears throat> oh, oh, there's uh, uh, you can get some bounds with extra assumptions about uh, LSD, the, the, the low spin dominance. Uh, there's uh, what we want is um, uh, uh, more data. We want some non-perturbative matter data. That would be very useful to tell us, inform us again about the island uh, to confirm that, that the physically valid theories really are on that island. Uh, and uh, there's also been uh, papers that, that I mentioned just briefly about using information that come from uh, using uh, looking at different dimensionality uh, operators or contributions at, at one time bounds with Newton's constants, recent papers on that as well. Um, and the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, key point is uh, the consistent UV theories uh, appear to have much stronger constraints than so far is visible from two to two unitarity consideration. And that's still true despite in spite of some uh, very good recent progress. Uh, the island still is extremely tiny compared to our understanding of where it should be based on these general principles. Uh, we think that the answer may have something to do where we're gonna find more information is not just look at two to two, but there's probably uh, rich information that we can look at, uh, get from looking at the higher point. Um, okay, so conclusions. EFTs of uh, uh, the, the physical theories, they lie on the small islands, which I've been harping on. Um, the data that we have, our data-driven approach, uh, and this we take as our guiding, guiding for, for the future. Uh, the low spin dominance, that idea seems to play an uh, important role in the general structure, structure of the data. We've also derived some non-trivial bounds on R cubed coefficients, R, 
part of the fourth coefficients and uh, also looking at full helicity, there's new information that you can get. Uh, and there's, of course, various important tasks, finding better bounds. Uh, also with Newton's constant, where there's been some papers, recent papers, uh, non-perturbative ideas, looking at non-perturbative matter would be very important. Uh, and the study of end to end constraints, not just two to two constraints. And I think it's pretty clear that uh, looking at the recent progress that a lot more is coming uh, and we're going to learn uh, much more about the physical constraints on EFTs, uh, including those for gravity. Okay, thank you.